Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to talk about Theodore Adorno's education after Auschwitz, which is a good follow-up to Adorno and Horkheimer's The Dialectic of Enlightenment. Now before jumping into it, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guineo. If you're new here, welcome, I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in ways that makes, in ways, in a way, that makes them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe, comment. I'd love to hear from you. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, please leave five stars, leave a review. I read all your reviews and comments. I don't have the time to respond to all of them, but I read them all. So I guess that's good. And if you found this in podcast form, you'll be able to find it on YouTube where I sometimes release videos. If you found this on YouTube, you'll be able to find it in podcast form anywhere where you get podcasts where there shouldn't be any ads, which would obviously be better. And if you want to help me out, obviously liking, sharing, subscribing helps me out a lot, or you can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. And yeah, don't waste any more of your time with that stuff. Let's jump into Adorno's education after Auschwitz. So for Adorno, the primary task of education following Auschwitz is to make sure that Auschwitz does not happen again, or anything that resembles it can happen again. But the problem with putting that into words implies that there's the, some kind of possibility of a counter argument where Adorno just wants this to be so internalized that there is no possibility to present a counter argument. This should be the only real function of education is to make sure that Auschwitz and the Holocaust more generally never happens in any form again. But Many people do not necessarily see it this way and might even think that, you know, might diminish the severity of the Holocaust or, you know, outright deny it, in which case they would, you know, not agree that education's job would be to make sure it does not happen again. So in that case, Adorno feels it necessary to address the people out there who exist that don't actually believe that education should have this function. But the way that Adorno believes that education should oppose everything to do with the Holocaust is that the Holocaust was an absolute example of what he calls barbarism, which, coming out of the dialectic of enlightenment, is meant to convey the sense that enlightenment, despite its promises of so-called civility, of technological prowess, of progression, actually comes with it very negative elements, ones that he equates with a kind of barbarism or a kind of incivility. So for example, with the Enlightenment and many of the logics that it portends comes the development of new ways to uh, treat people for diseases, comes new uh, technological capacities that make people's lives easier, so on and so forth, but also come more efficient ways to kill people, also come nuclear bombs, which are don't serve any utility other than the promise of ending lives. So insofar as education is, and I think everyone would agree, education is a way to wrest people or take people away from a lack of knowledge, away from ignorance. In that way, it should be just in itself opposed to everything that the Holocaust stood for, everything that kind of even motivated the formation and the, the crystallization of the Holocaust. But education is not an institution just on its own floating away from the rest of society. So it has to contend with many other elements in society. One of them is nationalism. And nationalism very much eclipses anything that might be kind of gleaned from education to oppose the crystallization of the Holocaust or anything of that sort because people feel a very strong affinity for their nation, especially in nationalism, and especially when the nation, at least the idea of the nation, is beginning to wane, is beginning to disappear with the emergence of you know, international commerce and travel and globalization, the nation doesn't have all that much sway. And so people feel or have a much stronger need to hold on to it and to make sure that it still has relevance and power which can give birth to very destructive things. So this is just one of the things that education is up against in trying to, I guess, foment or trying to develop 
a way by which to oppose the logic of the Holocaust. But interestingly, Adorno makes this almost an individual project where he says that education is not really equipped to challenge all of these other systemic factors. Instead, all it can do is kind of hope to seep into it, people at an individual level to teach them about the mechanisms that encourage or that encourage the formation of the Holocaust. So in his words, one must come to know the mechanisms that render people capable of such deeds. They must reveal these mechanisms to them. And this is essentially to motivate edu an education of critical self-reflection at a young age. Now, with this point, he's really drawing from what he and Horkheimer wrote in the Dialectic of Enlightenment, specifically the way that people just engage with the world kind of absentmindedly in, uh, under Enlightenment with under the culture industry. And so they want to motivate, or here Adorno wants to encourage people not to just take the world for granted or social structures for granted or other people for granted, and instead must always be cautious, must always be prepared to defend those things if they come under threat by lack of enlightenment, by uh, various malicious uh, structures or very malicious actors. Now, the way that I'm framing this as a kind of battle between enlightenment and anti-enlightenment demands a little bit of clarification. Because for them, it's not so simple that anti-enlightenment and enlightenment are on different sides of, of a battlefield fighting it out. In fact, both enlightenment and anti-enlightenment contain elements of the other within them. And this is the nature of the dialectic itself, where no one thing is determined purely by itself, but very much by its proximity to others, by proximity to its opposite, from which it borrows an identification, borrows the capacity to identify itself, which implies then that it has some basic connection to it. Now, I developed that more fully, or I developed that more fully in the Dialectic of Enlightenment, so if you want to listen to those episodes, you can go do that. But this is just to, you know, clear up that water that anti-enlightenment and enlightenment aren't totally opposed. And in doing this or motivating this kind of education, Adorno is signaling his dissatisfaction with some other more basic explanations of the formation of the Holocaust or that allowed the Holocaust to come into formation and to fruition. And one of them is that, or one of the explanations was that people lack bonds. And so therefore they lost attachment to one another, which allowed them to see humans as dispensable, as expendable, and could therefore be eradicated. But Adorno is not satisfied with this, and he's really borrowing from Freud to some extent here, but also departing from Freud, in that he recognizes that bonds actually on their own, or without proper critical reflection, might motivate something like the Holocaust. Because when people form these bonds, especially a bond formed around hatred, then they can do pretty reprehensible things. So we must, on the one hand, encourage people to be able to form communities that communities that are in the benefit of society at large and of people at large, but also we must, through this kind of critical self-reflection, we must motivate a kind of autonomy, the capacity for individuals to say no to something that is oppressive and to recognize in themselves when they are being oppressive which demands that we confront, at least in this education, that we confront the horrors committed in the name of enlightenment, in the name of scientific progress, and that we don't just push all that stuff under the rug and just forget about it. So there are some arguments that say, well, in order to not repeat the Holocaust, we have to just, you know, inject love into the system and just whitewash everything. Now for Adorno, we can't simply get past something like the Holocaust. It's something we must confront every day for essentially the rest of, of time because it was the crystallization of potentially the worst possibility in uh, human existence in terms of enlightenment logic. And to just get past it or to just get over it would, I guess, um, cultivate the possibility of it happening again because then we'd forget about the horrors of it. Now, to kind of add to this, 
a, a sort of sociological dimension that is not just a purely psychological one. He notes that in the case of the concentration camps, many of them were operated in the country, as, as many would know, and therefore they were operated by, in his words, the sons of many country uh, people, which is, you know, obviously a, a good point. And he says that there is the possibility of this happening in the country seems to be more intense than that in the city. Now, of course, he's not totally naive. He sees that in cities and towns, the very same possibilities emerge. But to confront this issue within the cities, he proposes two kind of solutions that television, which people were starting, people were starting to uh, get their first televisions at this time. Television can be a way to disseminate educational material. So that's something that could be fostered. But also he proposes that like volunteer teachers go into these communities and just teach about the horrors of what humans are capable of with the tools of enlightenment. And I don't know how applicable these solutions are, but that's what he gives us. But of course, this isn't reducible to country people. And he gives the example of sport and how big you know, sporting events are a demonstration in themselves of both enlightenment and anti-enlightenment. And he defines it as enlightenment or characterizes it as enlightenment in the way that sports foster so-called fair play and civility and good sportsmanship and all that. But at the same time, especially at the level of the spectators, there's a great deal of anger in sporting events and how people root for their team and hate the other team. And in this is are these so-called anti-barbaric or sorry, anti-enlightenment barbaric elements of this, what might appear to be a more civil way of living in the world, which is in the case of this city. Now, in the case of sports spectators, he uses this example to extend more broadly to the formation of collectives. And this is building from his disdain for the idea about bonds. But with collectives, especially how they are fostered in a kind of exclusionary way and come about through, in, if, if anyone's gone to uh, university or what's been on a university sports team might know about hazing, which is a kind of ritualistic practice that involves punishing new students or new players on a team in order to get them ready for whatever it's obviously reprehensible and it's uh, shouldn't be at all condoned and yeah so he says through that people are kind of enter into compliant collectives which is to say that people are from a very young age they are beaten to not be emotional you know through schooling through religion through whatever they're beaten to not be emotional, to be hard, to be cold, to be rational, to be reasonable, which in turn makes them all that much more likely to inflict the same pain on others because they went through it to join their little collective. So therefore, they should inflict that or they, they've earned the right to inflict that upon others. So a proper education for Adorno wouldn't repress people's emotional uh, emotional feelings, they wouldn't repress people's anxieties because, and he's borrowing from Freud here, many of these kinds of ailments that people suffer with, these kind of moments of emotional distress that schools, businesses, churches beat out of people are responses to a system that is oppressing them. They are responses to, in kind of Freud's words, a system that is sick. So it's not the human that is sick, it's the system that is sick, that is not fostering the right kind of connections or allowing people to engage at the world in a way that makes sense to them. And through this process forms the possibility or comes about or emerges what he calls the manipulative character or a kind of person that, that manipulates. That is, they only see the world as being for themselves and they will manipulate anyone and anything to attain their place in the world that they feel is right for them. And this person, this manipulative character, suffers from what he calls a reified consciousness, which is a consciousness blinded to all historical past, all insight into one's conditionedness, which is for him to say that uh, it's like a fetishization of oneself, where you see yourself as the kind of center of the world. You forget, of course, all the ways that you've been shaped to think that way through certain capitalist logic, the logic of self-preservation, all of these things, the logic of enlightenment, 
that make you the center of the universe and position you against everyone else. You forget all that and you take it to be natural so you don't question it. And that encourages everyone to engage in this way, to participate in a so-called dog-eat-dog world, which just culminates into institutional systemic violence inflicted upon others by everybody else. Now, this reified consciousness for Adorno risks being even worse or becoming worse with technology, because in very much the same way, technology is detached from any kind of possibility toward what he calls a life of human dignity, and instead technology as a tool becomes a thing in itself and is completely detached from both its history and its use. So he says that in the case of the Holocaust, and he's I think that he's really spot on about this, there was a kind of car compartment, car compartmentalization, Jesus, compartmentalization occur that made it so people would only be working on little individual parts of the entire system of the Holocaust. So there'd just be one person operating the train, another person organizing people onto trains, which would take them then to various concentration camps. And he says, because of this, each person, just because they forget what the tech or refuse to acknowledge what the technology is used for, then see the technology as being an enterprise and end in itself. So someone is just given the job, oh, organize this train system or set up this train network, uh, and that's going to be your job. And they say, okay, because that's an end in itself. They don't question what this technology is used for or whether it can be used for good. Instead, they just treat the technology as a thing in itself, which then allows malevolent people to use it for evil things. And with this emerges the possibility that people come to love technology more than they actually come to love human beings and grow then indifferent to the suffering of others as it is produced through technology because technology takes kind of front seat for them. And one of the ways that I think that this culminates is in a personification of objects and an objectification of human beings. And in their coldness, the coldness of people who prefer technology over humans, in that coldness, they develop a bond. And here's that troubling terrain of bonds again. They develop bonds with other unloving people, people who do not have an attachment to others, but instead only have an attachment to technology. And so it is important to kind of lead an attack against this unloving nature at an individual level to make people aware of the various structures that form them in this way to reveal that it's not natural. And this is one of the great tricks of capitalism is that it teaches people that capitalism is natural, that it's, it is the only way to go about being in the world and all that comes with it, like individuality, like self-preservation, like a move away from community, like generosity. All of these things are treated as being unnatural in the face of capitalism's naturalism, the way that it conveys itself as nature. But again, it would be wrong to just say, oh, well, we need to teach harmony or we need to teach love or force people to love because, of course, that can't happen. These structures need to be overhauled in order for that to happen. But the duty of education is to make people aware of these structures and reveal to them that they are not natural. They are not the only way to organize people and to organize the relationships between people. And the kind of last little tidbit that Adorno provides is that people should also be taught about the effectiveness of resistance to power, to oppression, through their being taught about resistance groups. And that more or less covers this short essay. I just felt like it was a good follow-up to the Dialectic of Enlightenment. So if you haven't listened to that, those two episodes yet, uh, go check that out. You'll probably enjoy it. I hope it's a real uh, tricky one. But if there's anything about this text that I might have excluded that you think is important or anything that I got wrong, I'd love to hear about it. And you know how to do that. Again, if you've listened to this on Apple Podcasts, leave five stars if you like what I did, leave a review. If you're listening to this on YouTube or whatever, uh, like, share, comment. I'd love to hear from you. And yeah, catch you next time. Take care.